I don't know if Ohio, if that's required or not, but I mean, for students, I think it's, it's good to have that. Anyhow, um, what did you, you notice about the, that free response or what was toughest for you about, about those? So go ahead, Tanner. I just got burned on the concept of spouse's law. I definitely have to keep studying that. Okay. Makes sense. And the wording for that, like, box, the charge of point A with that box was kind of confusing. I would agree with that for sure. The wording is is always going to be something odd with AP questions. You, you, easy to second-guess yourself. Sarah? I realized that it was about Gauss's law, and I just did a bunch more research about Gauss's law before I did it, and then it made sense. Before that, though, it did not make sense. <laughs> and unfortunately, Gauss's law is one of the things we've done um, remotely, which is definitely harder to gain a good understanding of. Um, where did you go, Sarah, to, to do that extra research? I just Googled some videos about example problems and watched them on YouTube. Good. Was it like Khan Academy or... I don't remember. It was some guy who seemed like a teacher. I don't know. Maybe flipping physics. Long long hair? Didn't show his face with his hands and his writing stuff down. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, uh, okay, that makes sense. How about uh, John? What did you find difficult about it or what um, was challenging for you? I agree with Tanner. Uh, letter C for the first one. I only I only chose one of the things because I didn't know we could choose multiple. Okay. Good but, practice yeah. to know that. How about Nate's? So we kind of got tricked by question D because at first we thought A because it's zero. And then we looked on to the next problem and we saw we had to make um, like an equation using this variable. So if it was A, it was just zero. So we thought it would have to be F because that's the only one to actually have a value. Are you on uh, which question? D. Question one, part D. Okay. So I did the same thing. <laughs> okay. So for this? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. So. Yeah, and I, in some ways, I think that was good because, like, when, they, when they're going to ask you to do things this year, and I looked at this, I didn't think you would be able to do too much writing with things, you know? And, but a simple answer, like, electric field equals zero, that you could do. So my gut instinct is that if you see something you think you can't do, you might want to – you might need to think about it a little differently. Um, okay. How about uh, – Lauren, um, something that you found difficult about either of those two free responses? Uh, I'm with Tanner. I just had trouble with the Gauss's law part of it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's a like I say, it's a it's a tough concept. I know when I gave you like information on this, I did a screencast. I did a screencast off of notes on the web. But sometimes it's really useful to hear those people who are professional presenters or just to hear it a little bit differently. So I'm going um, to I'm going to present my solutions to it now and talk about a couple little things in terms of how I attacked it. Um, obviously, you've seen the rubric uh, as well. So um, let me go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay. So actually, I didn't need to do that, did I? Okay. Um So basically something like this if, if you think about Gauss's law, it's this weird symbol, electric flux. Technically, there should be a little circle in there. Surface integral of electric field times area is equal to charge over E sub zero, which is vacuum permittivity. The key thing is this is the, the charge enclosed. So big, big 
big, 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 big idea about Gauss's law is you have no flux if you don't have any charge enclosed. So I think if you, if you can really remember that and think about how they might try to fool you or how to, to sneak that understanding in, I think that'll be helpful. So if this has um, surface charge density of a certain amount on its outside surface, no charge anywhere inside, no charge enclosed, no flux. Um, this one here, so if they're no longer uniform, um, you actually can get a net electric field on the inside. And basically the reason for that would be that the vector sum of the, all the individual electric fields caused by the individual charges would, you know, wouldn't vectorally cancel out. So we generally don't think of this as being able to happen with a conductor since the charges would rearrange instantly um, to get to a point where you have no electric field on the inside of the conductor. Um, I have a question for A. Yeah. So, well, this is just more in general, but when you use Gauss's law, does it always have to be like a 3D surface or is it ever a 2D one? So that is a, a really good question um, because they, in, in chapter 27, they gave some examples about like passing through a surface, right? Or it was like a plane or something like that. So we normally will think about it as a 3D surface. However, when we get down here to this part, you're really thinking about what is passing through, say, some of these different parts of this cube. However, the idea is that there is some charge enclosed with this cube, so there is a net flux through the cube itself. So in general, you really are probably going to want to think about a three-dimensional shape. Um, but the big idea behind flux in general, other than this one about charge enclosed, is if you don't have field lines going through an, an area or region of area, you have no flux. So the idea here is like that if we think about an imaginary Gaussian surface like a sphere, which is the simplest shape, we've got an area of 4 pi r squared. Here, the surface area is not 4 pi r squared. But we really are talking about flux spreading through some of these areas. So this surface area, this surface area, and this surface area. So I do think you, you generally really want to think about a three-dimensional shape. So that's a good question. So I think everybody is correct about saying that this was hard to visualize. Um, I actually, first time I gave this question, I think it, more students were able to visualize it than I was. But you've got this charge over here, or it's a small sphere. It's got a charge plus Q on it at the surface. So these ones would not have any flux. I think the part that's tough, it was just really tough for me to visualize, like, what the heck is going on here? However, if you think about arrows spreading out radially in all directions from that little sphere, any arrows along this plane would be parallel to it. So they won't pass into that plane or out of that plane. They would emanate away from the sphere along that plane. And the same way with the bottom one, A, D, E, H, and A, B, G, H. Anything where part of this surface is touching that dot means you wouldn't have arrows going into the surface or into that area or out of the area, they'd be parallel to it. So I, I do think that was tough to visualize for sure. I would agree. Um, yep. And then over here, again, this is one where I think someone asked about this already. Um, if that's inside the sphere, the field must be zero. Otherwise, if you look at this and you didn't think of this as being zero, uh, you would think of this. Is that correct? Because that's the farthest distance, so weakest field? Yay, yay or nay? I can't see you. Yay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that makes sense. Um, but yeah, that was, that was sneaky. 
Okay, determine the electric field uh, strength at the position you've indicated in terms of these things. Well, again, here, if you determine it would be zero, then um, that's pretty easy. Charge enclosed is, is zero, zero field strength. If not, so let's go back and take a look at that picture. If not, what you would have to do is think of the field strength in general is being E equals, it's either KQ over R squared or uh, 1 over 4 pi R squared times Q. So I'm going to do the simpler one. So something like that. Well, that's plus Q. This distance from A to F, you would have to basically do a, a Trithagorean theorem, essentially, to get that distance, which would be really a bit harder to do, right? Because if it was up at C or E or G, it would just simply be radical 2 times L. Over here, it's further away than that. Um, and again, that would be, I think, a little bit difficult, but it, it would be this general formula, but the Oh, pardon me, kq over r squared. Um, but it would be where th this distance would be in your denominator. So for this one, I changed the wording, and I don't know if I did it great, because basically I said in, ter ugh, said in terms of this total flux. Um, but the idea is you'd have basically 1 24th as much. So... If one eighth of the the sphere, or one eighth of the sphere is inside this surface, specifically inside over here, then that also means if the charge is spread uniformly throughout, um, you would have one eighth the charge um, in there, and you have three surfaces where the flux can pass through because we said these three. We couldn't pass through this one, which is C D E F, this one G F E H, this one B C F G. All three of those um, would be passed through. So essentially, you've got one eighth the charge and one third of the total surface that the flux is passing through. And so that's how you get the 124th. Again, I think this was a tough question, but I, I think this is a tough topic. Are there any other questions about um, that particular one? So when dealing with that like formula, how it has like the line integral, then E times the area, and then also has like, the charge over the constant. Should we mostly just look at that like charge over the constant version of the formula? I think so, yes. So um, usually when you have something like this, understanding that flux is related only to the charge that's enclosed is, again, probably the most important thing. If you want to find the field strength at any particular point, basically you need to, you know, you get to create an imaginary surface. And since a sphere is symmetrical, that's that's the one that's normally created. And then basically you would find the surface area of the sphere which is 4 pi r squared, and you could use that to get the electric field strength. But in terms of understanding flux, I think that part of the equation is the most critical. Yep. So this is the one from 2008. So I'm going to kind of go back here and ask, um, do most people think that they, they did better on the first one or the second one? Uh, second. <laughs> um, John just raised one finger, but that's a naughty finger, so that's okay. I don't even know if John's there or not. He's not moving. I mean, it acts like he's there, but he could be frozen in a picture. Oh, there he goes. He moved his head. That's good. Um, John, did you say one or two is easier for you? 
I definitely did better on the second one. Okay. I think the second one is a, a bit better one, honestly, related to to what they might ask this year in Gauss's Law. I think it's a nice one to look at. So something like this, if you're thinking about like um, the induced charge on each of these, even though this is neutral, hopefully you recognize that the inner surface will have a negative charge equal in magnitude to the charge on this sphere. Because anywhere within this shaded region of this like donut shape, you've got to have zero flux. You're not presenting. Say again? You're oh, not I'm not presenting. Wow. Yeah, I keep, ah, I wish there was a way, easier way to, to do it on and off. I guess I could do the window. Hold on. If I do the window, how does it look different than if I do the whole screen? Or does it look any different? This is where you could answer. So when I present a window, does it look different than when I present the whole screen or not? It's basically the same. It's like the yeah, yeah, that's the same. Okay. Okay. Never mind then. Um, so yeah, so in here, like I said, this I mean it said this was neutral, but you you should recognize that since this has a positive charge you have to have a negative charge on this inside surface equal in magnitude to this plus Q because anywhere in this region, like I said, it was this, this donut, the flux has to be zero and the field would be zero in that particular case also. So um, I've got negative Q here, positive Q on the outside because we have to have these two equal zero net charge since it said it was. Sometimes they'll say it's neutral and sometimes they'll say it's uncharged. I really don't like the term uncharged because it implies that there's no charges in it at all. And yet all matter has positives and negatives. But that's something very common for you to see. Um, this reasoning. Again, these two hopefully pretty easy because there's no charge enclosed. This one. They would give it to you for this form of it, of the um, electric field formula, which you don't need to understand Gauss's law or this one. So again, I'm, I don't think they're gonna ask you for a formula or to write down formulas, especially with things like superscripts on this exam. Um, but I, if they did, I mean, I think this version would be reasonable to write. So. Again, it just depends on the net charge enclosed. This one here, if you understand that the field is zero in here, that's good. So that would be zero. This should still decrease in the shape of an inverse square. So if I drawn it correctly, it really should look like a smooth curve here, connecting the region A, B, and then the region beyond C. So that's one of those things, like I said, I think um, kind of important to understand that. I'm going to talk in a bit about something else down at the bottom of the page I did. So if you were, and I, I'm going to ask again for your feedback on this, if you were to make a graph of electric potential, which is voltage versus distance from the center, what do you think it would look like? So V versus R. Um, would the voltage decrease as it gets further away? Okay, so definitely it will decrease in general as it gets further away. Um, we want to sort of zone in on any of these particular regions. So zero to A, A to B, B to C, and beyond C. So I'm going to ask. If we had no charge between B and C, would it still be zero voltage? It, it won't be zero voltage, but it will be a constant voltage. So something to think about here is that we know that electric field strength is equal to negative 
dv over dr. And again, the negative just tells you the direction of it. So if I have this is, in this particular case, On our formula sheets, what is the D6 equation? I mean, the E6 equation for? Hold on for one second. Okay. So, if this is your general formula for electric field from a point source or from a sphere, um, and this R is basically the distance from the center, and also we have electric field strength as change in voltage with respect to position, then that's kind of actually how we get this, which is, so this is R to the negative two, right? And this is R to the negative one. So to get the electric field, we would take like the, the derivative of voltage with respect to position. To get the electric field from this, we take the antiderivative, which would actually give us that equation. And in fact, that also helps explain the negative a little bit because this is R to the negative one. So that's hopefully kind of interesting with something like that. So definitely in general, as you get further away, this will decrease. Um, so Tanner, you asked a, about equation E6, is that correct? Yeah, it kind of looks like what you have at the bottom that a V equals. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So. That basically is, if you want to get electric potential, which is voltage, um, it's a summation of all the KQ over Rs. So the thing in front of the summation symbol, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub naught, um, is the same thing as Coulomb's law constant, which is K. And so essentially, if we have a, a set of charges at certain distances, then we can simply add up the KQ over Rs, um, recognizing that this can be a positive or negative value, but does not have a direction. This would, you would never think of as positive or negative, but you would think of it as having a direction like outward or inward or something like that. So remind me in a few minutes and I'll show an example of that that I gave to my AP2 class this year, okay? Okay. I'll that. So I'm gonna go back to, um, I'm going to ask Nate of the air variety. What do you think voltage versus distance graph would look like in here? Um, for sections 0 to A and B to C, it would be a constant value, and I think it would be less during B to C. Okay. Less in magnitude, at least. Yep. I think I would agree with that. Which and means E and C it on, it would like decrease in magnitude. Uh, you mean between A and B and then C and, and B on C, correct? Yeah, okay. So yeah, so this curve is supposed to be an inverse square relationship. What I think you would have down here would be something like this. So this would be at KQ over A, and I'll come back to that in a minute. This is just an inverse relationship here. This is just an inverse relationship here. I th I'm a little unsure about this, but I, I think it would be at a value of KQ over C, the outer surface. So this one I'm absolutely certain of, and that's why I say I think it would be a, uh, KQ over C. And that means there's a, an odd little gap here. So let me show that again and talk about that. So the potential in a region of space inside that conductor can't be changing because we know the electric field is zero. If this changed at all, we would have something other than a zero electric field. So definitely a flat line here, definitely a flat line here. And if you remember, again, in order, if we start with this formula to get this formula here, um, we need to take the antiderivative. Right. So, um, so in order to um, 
to look back at this, this A is the radius, and all those charges are on the outside. So how tightly packed they are is going to affect the voltage, because voltage is kind of like electrical pressure. It's how you know much they're pushing against each other, how much potential energy they per charge they have. So if the spacing of the charges is dependent on this radius, then you could treat this as the potential at this radius would be kq over a. But since the potential can't change anywhere in here, anywhere within this region, whether it is a solid conductor or a hollow conductor, would also be kq over a. And that's why, like I said, I think the um, potential for this outer conductor would have to be kq over c due to that reason, same reasoning. So I think that's actually a, a pretty useful thing to think about. Um, this one, I don't think they would ask you it quite like this. I, I tried to change the wording a little bit. So essentially, this is an energy problem. So E initial is equal to E final. You, if you think of being at infinity and the charge isn't, the electron isn't moving, you have no kinetic energy and no potential energy because it's not interacting with this, these spheres at infinity. And the end, we know we're going to have some kinetic energy because it's moving. And therefore, it would have to have some non-zero potential energy. Well, zero is equal to a positive, and this has to be a negative. Mathematically, that works out because to get the potential energy, it's a negative times a positive. So we have a negative value here. And I go through and I kind of solve that. Like I said, I don't think the AP would ask you to do any sort of equation-y things like this because that's really tough to type in. But I do think they could ask you how you would think about it. And the, the key is the change in electric potential energy has to equal, the, so the loss of electric potential energy has to equal the gain of kinetic energy. So you would need to indicate somehow that this would be a loss and this would be a gain. Are there any other questions on that stuff? Okay. Um, so what I'm uh, going to ask you to do for tomorrow, that we're going to, we're pretty much done with even the review that I think we were going to do on electricity and magnetism. Although I definitely can answer other questions along the way. Um, I may host like a Google Hangout the weekend before your AP exam at some point um, where I actually go into school and try to record from there so I can do stuff like on a large whiteboard. I don't know if that'd be useful or not, but I think it's probably better. Um, I can't I can't do that normally to go in. That's kind of a pain in the butt, but I think I could do that on a given day. Um, but what I'm going to ask that you do is take a look at these screencasts, or I put in the stream yesterday. I hope you like the squirrel videos. You should look at the squirrel videos. All these five steps to a five, and again, if you've got them, Easier to look in your book than to look at these kind of janky PDFs. Um, but I asked you to look at Chapter 10. That was really brief. Probably 10, 11, and 12 are useful because really they just relate to 10 is super simple since you aren't going to have to draw free body diagrams, but it's useful to think about them. And then 11 and 12 are kinematics and Newton's second law. They do a tiny little bit of Newton's third law. In the, the chapter 12 also, so kinematics is chapter 11, and Newton's second law, and a little bit of third law is in chapter 12. So I think those are things people are fairly comfortable with overall. So it'd be nice to look at those for either for tomorrow or for um, probably for tomorrow, because I kind of, the part that I know people really would like to review some is the rotational stuff. And if we can get that to, to that earlier, I think that'll be helpful. So if I can get those done tomorrow, then we'll kind of go through and do the rotational stuff 
like part of um, five steps to a five for Tuesday. I'll ask you to submit me some questions for Tuesday. We'll go over that. We'll do some practice problems with those. Um, again, that'll give us a little more time with that. So I think that'll be useful. What is this, Lauren? Oh, that's a hat. Those are hats. Never mind. Okay. Because I looked up, I didn't know what it was at first. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to stop recording. I don't know where it saves it. Oh, there it says, Doug Forrest's Google Drive.